everyone. My name is Yukio Lippet, and uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you back to the uh, third panel, the first afternoon panel of University as Collector. This panel is titled Art and Artifact, and uh, the rationale for the panel uh, consists of nothing more than bringing together four art historians who, in their own ways, do remarkable object-oriented research, but from very different uh, perspectives, you might say. And one of the guiding um, questions uh, for this panel uh, in our minds, in the minds of the organizers, has been, uh, why are these objects here and not there? Uh, I'm going to introduce all of the speakers uh, before uh, they come and then ask them to come up uh, to the podium. Uh, and I'm going to introduce them from the, uh, in reverse order to their presentations. So I'd first like to introduce uh, Professor Joseph Kerner, who's the Victor S. Thomas Professor of the History of Art and Architecture, a specialist in Northern European painting, uh, really from the Renaissance to the present. And uh, difficult to know uh, where to begin uh, in introducing my colleague. I'll just say that um, uh, he, is, uh, he, had, he is currently involved in uh, overseeing the Vienna Project at Harvard, uh, the center of which is the historical documentary film uh, the Burning Child, which explores Vienna at the turn of the last century through the lens of home and homemaking. Uh, our third speaker today is also a colleague of my own in the History of Art and Architecture Department, Jennifer Roberts, who is Elizabeth Carey Agassiz, Professor of the Humanities and Harvard College Professor. Uh, she uh, has published extensively, has books on Robert Smithson and history, and most recently, uh, Transporting Visions, The Movement of Images in Early America. The second speaker for our panel today is Barbara Fash, who is uh, the director of the Corpus of Maya Hieroglyphic Inscriptions Program and Mesoamerican Laboratory at the Peabody Museum at Harvard. And she's also, uh, she's an artist and the co-director of the Copan Mosaics Project. And she also built uh, the Copan Sculpture Museum. She kind of splits her time between Cambridge and Copan in this very uh, uh, glamorous life. Uh, and uh, finally, we arrive at our first speaker for the panel, who is uh, Ethan Lasser, the Margaret S. Winthrop Associate Curator of American Art at the Harvard Art Museums. And uh, he, is, uh, from, he was at the Chipstone Foundation in Milwaukee, where he was instrumental in the formation of Object Lab, a program using hands-on research to teach American craft and history. And he is currently uh, preparing an exhibition titled From the Philosophical Chamber, Harvard's Lost Collection, which uh, will, uh, will be open in 2017, and that also happens to be the title of his talk today. Please join me in welcoming Ethan to the podium. Well, thank you, thanks for having me. I was thrilled to be invited to uh, be part of this conference because I've spent the, really, since I arrived at Harvard uh, two and a half years ago, thinking about the university as collector, both in my role installing a present collection, the Harvard Art Museum's collection of American art, but also in researching uh, this collection from the past, which I'm going to talk about. And I should say, too, that uh, this talk will have some nice intersections with both the um, remarks this morning from Stephen Coit and from Professor Ulrich. So uh, I thank them, and you'll see a lot of kindredness between our different projects. So in the late 18th and early 19th century, the second floor of Harvard Hall, the space uh, roughly right here behind these windows, was home to a wide-ranging collection of portraits, prints, cutting-edge scientific instruments, ancient coins and metals, animal and mineral specimens, and a range of artifacts gathered on the first American circumnavigation. And this collection has its roots in a fire, which we heard a bit about already, in 1764, uh, an earlier structure on the site of Harvard Hall, Harvard Hall II, burned to the ground, uh, consuming the college library and a small but significant set of portraits and instruments. And Harvard officials immediately drew on a network of alumni and supporters to repair this loss. And within a decade, uh, a new collection was built that dwarfed its predecessor. So let's take a look inside. Uh, here's the second floor of Harvard Hall in plan from 1767. Uh, and by 1800, the building opens in 1766, and by 1800, these three rooms on the right are 
teeming with artifacts, with over 1,500 artifacts, uh, images and artifacts, instruments for teaching and research, uh, such as the object at upper right, a tray of slides for the compound microscope, now in the collection of historical scientific instruments. Uh, these instruments were held and uh, stored and displayed in a space called the apparatus chamber, apparatus closet, which you see on the top there. Uh, curios collected abroad and specimens like the flattened fish in the middle. Uh, this is a flattened and bisected sucker fish. They could be found in the uh, Grand University Museum, which you see on bottom right, which is about the size of a closet. Uh, and uh, objects from these two rooms were wheeled out uh, and carried out into the uh, philosophy school or philosophy chamber. Uh, that's the real grand room, one that served as a boardroom for meetings of the Harvard Corporation, uh, for meetings of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and also as a lecture hall where courses in natural philosophy, thus the name philosophy chamber, uh, for, where courses in natural philosophy and natural history were conducted. And as we'll see, this elegant space was also home to its own collection of portraits, prints, and portrait busts, like the uh, fellow at bottom right, who you know now, Nicholas Boylston, uh, shown here in the detail. And the artifacts in these rooms came to attract visitors and attention across the Atlantic world, uh, visitors from North and, and South America. But in 1831, they were dispersed to make way for an expansion of that library on the left. Uh, and today, only a small portion of this original collection survives. And with the help uh, of uh, a great archive and with the help of colleagues from across campus, and I would echo Laurel's remarks about what uh, really has allowed me to do this research is the collection of Harvard experts in various museums and departments uh, because with their help, we've tracked down almost 150 objects uh, from uh, this original collection. They're in museums, they're in departmental collections. We found things in closets and uh, even one attic. Uh, and the objects range from a tiny uh, thumb-sized piece of lava collected at the foot of Vesuvius to a massive 11-foot long tracing of an inscription on a rock, on Dighton Rock, a Native American inscription in uh, southern Massachusetts. And as Keo said, we're going to bring these things together uh, in, the 2000, in 2017 for an exhibition, um, both to explore this collection, but more generally to explore the role of objects in teaching and research in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And with that sort of introduction, I'm going to move to a specific artifact. I had a big pool to choose from, from these 150 things. Uh, but what I wanted to discuss is a rather recent find and that's uh, this inventory, which I'm gonna help you read, uh, which I found tucked away in a mis miscellaneous folder in the Harvard archives. And I I'm so excited about this find, which is quite recent, that I'm gonna walk you through this whole document. But basically, what we're seeing here is uh, three columns on the left-hand wall as you enter, on the front wall, on the south wall, and that refers left-hand wall as you enter, front wall, south wall of the philosophy chamber. Uh, the, the inventories from about 1800 to 1810, it's not dated. And what appears in each column is a list of the works on the wall. Uh, so um, we're, uh, we're looking left now, engraving of the London Medical Society, portrait of the Honorable Samuel Dexter, engraving from paintings by Robert Smirk, and then Mount Etna. The way in which they're classifying and listing these things actually differs uh, from entry to entry, the amount of information you get. Front wall, uh, Stephen Coit will appreciate this. Uh, full length portrait, Mr. Boylston by Copley. So that's John Singleton Copley's Nicholas Boylston. Uh, full length portrait of Mr. Hollis by Copley. Then uh, some people we know, President Adams by Trumbull, Washington by Trumbull, Fisher Ames by Stewart, Plaster Cass, ancient philosophers Nero, Demosthenes, President Adams, Homer, Socrates. <laughs> yeah, Adams has a lot of, uh, wait, wait till you see Washington. Full-length portrait of Mr. Hancock by Copley, full-length portrait of Dr. Hersey by uh, Edward Savage, and then Marble Bust of Washington by Houdon. And the most motley uh, wall is the South Wall, 
find uh, the wall to your right as you enter the space. Finding of Moses from a painting by Pelham. So we get information that this is a print. Uh, Washington from a painting by Savage, our third George in the small room. Battle of Bunker Hill, Death of Montgomery, prints by Trumbull. Henry Lawrence from a painting by Copley. Uh, plaster cast of the Earl of Chatham. The Agony in the Garden, the Annunciation, no information, prints, paintings, artist. Uh, and last, General Lincoln from a painting by Sargent. So 27 works uh, spread across three walls. And this very quick read makes clear, I think, that this is a hang that breaks all of our curatorial rules today, a hang in which prints intermingle with oils, the moderns sit next to the ancients, and certain subjects appear on the same wall in multiple formats, Adams twice, Washington three times. Uh, and as you can imagine, there wasn't much space between these works either, none of that breathing room that curators like today. We're fortunate that with the exception of the ancient bus, the front wall, uh, most of the works on the front wall survive, uh, and we've built a digital reconstruction, the research team and I, of what this wall would have looked like. So were you to walk into the philosophy chamber and say 1799, you would be greeted by something like this. Uh, there was a question earlier about the gen gender of the portrait collection, and uh, I can't help much there because what you see is an audience of uh, nine male faces staring back at you and works jammed together so tightly that they coalesce into a kind of group portrait or grand piece of installation art. Uh, Boylston, Hollis, Adams, Washington, Ames, Hancock, Savage, Washington, Adams on top. Uh, and we are not showing these with the frame, with their frames on, so you must imagine them even closer together. We've calculated there were six inches between each of the paintings. Uh, and it was all hung on top of this vibrant flock wallpaper that John Hancock donated in 1772. Uh, wallpaper, we, uh, a fragment of this was discovered in a renovation of Harvard Hall in the 1960s, so we know the room looked this vibrant. And uh, it's a room we're going to try and recreate, or, or this wall we'll try and recreate in the show. And I think it's important to keep in mind that while this installation may bring to mind, a, a, say, a library in a British country house or a dining hall at Oxford or Cambridge or even the faculty room in University Hall that we've heard about, this was no state or static display, but it was the backdrop against which generations of Harvard students learned natural philosophy and natural history. Uh, indeed, we know that this room was home to two large-scale objects that made clear it was a space where art, science, and pedagogy crossed. An 18-foot uh, long case containing some 800 minerals stood in the center of the room, and so did this uh, extraordinary thing. This is the Joseph Pope Orrery, the first model of the solar system uh, made in Boston. So Harvard uh, owns some British orreries. This is the first one made in Boston. It's now in a collection of historical scientific instruments. And uh, it also stood in front of that wall of portraits uh, and is also a, a work with its own portraits of uh, Newton, uh, Ben Franklin, and James Bowden, the governor of Massachusetts. And as I said earlier, artifacts from those other rooms, from the apparatus closet and the university museum, also come out for handling, discussion, display, interpretation in front of that wall. So. Uh, one way, I think, to approach this wall in our inventory is to think about the curatorial logic and ambitions behind the space. It was exciting for me to discover this piece of paper in the Harvard archives because uh, it, was a, it gave me a sense that I was connecting somehow to the thinking of my own predecessors to an earlier chapter in the history of curating at Harvard. And of course, the question is, what is the logic that links the hang to the context of natural history and natural philosophy? What did it mean for the student in say 1805 to learn about the orbit of the earth with that spinning orrery or the anatomy of the sucker fish with that flattened specimen uh, with uh, George Washington staring back at him? Or what were all those Harvard benefactors that loomed behind the Hollis professor in the midst of his experimental lectures meant to convey? Or what does the very impulse to archive the collection, to divide it, to list it in three columns, have to do with the modes of classification that students were learning uh, in relation to the sciences in this very room? 
these are important questions, but I think there's another way to think about this wall and this inventory too, and one that's become vividly uh, clear to me as a kind of campus treasure hunter or uh, archaeologist these past few years, as someone who has set out, that is, to find the 27 works on that document uh, in order to bring them back together. And that is, and here I'll return to a point that kind of hovered over uh, our, our morning panels, that is that what that document registers is not just curatorial thinking, but uh, it registers loss and dispersal. So here's my last uh, slide, uh, a map of the location of the works that were once installed densely together on that wall. So here's our inventory circa uh, 2015. The portraits now hang or are stored uh, across campus. The prints are housed in various museum facilities and the busts are tucked away in the library and in a random Loeb House office. And as the text in the lower left-hand corner suggests of the original 27 works, 14 or more than 50% uh, are now lost. And this is really to ask the audience if you know where one of these things is. <laughs> we will buy you lunch. We, we will put your name in the catalog uh, because we've been looking for those uh, for some time. And this, th these odds, this 50% or just shy of 50% survival rate is, uh, as I said earlier, much better than that of this collection as a whole. So what the map suggests and what has become clear to our research team than uh, what we continually come up against in the course of preparing this show is that the history of university collecting is not only one of acquisition and use or of donations and commissions uh, or of object-based teaching and object-based knowledge of interpretable things, but is also one of loss and disappearance of once treasured and carefully conceived assemblages of objects broken apart. And this side of our story, of the philosophy chamber story, this end of the story, is quite difficult to reconstruct. There is no document like the inventory that identifies where the Harvard Hall artifacts went after 1831. We can track the movement of certain objects around campus uh, over the course of the last uh, several hundred years, but they're the exception rather than the rule. No entries in the college record books explain when and why certain works from this collection were lost uh, or articulate the, the larger shifts in the map of knowledge or the larger sets of institutional politics or the simple ob, uh, issues of object uh, conservation and decay that led to their disappearance or disposal. Uh, and yet I think if we really want to think about the university as collector, and here I'll make my last point, if we really want to understand the university as collector as different from, say, the private collector or the state collector, uh, I think we need to think not only about the growth of these collections, but also about their decline. Or to put it in the terms of our room, we need to think not only about the moment of the grand room with the flock wallpaper, but also about the afterlife of all those works on that list and on uh, our wall. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you to the organizers uh, for the invitation and for bringing all, all of us scholars together as a collection. I think it's really been an interesting uh, session today. Um, I also want to thank my colleagues at the museum for their helpful um, feedback and statistics for this paper. The object I chose from the Peabody Museum collections to speak about today, I believe, exemplifies the, how the practice of collecting in anthropology has changed drastically in the past century, and how the objects that were obtained through those earlier practices continue to evolve in their new locations. This evolution involves research on the object, which in turn refocuses significance on the object's wider cultural context and brings a fresh understanding of its past, present, and future purposes. We commonly encounter the belief that if an object is not on display at the university, it is not being used. I do. However, if we examine the statistics of researchers coming to the Peabody Museum um, to study objects in the collection, we see they counter that misconception. Over the past 12 years, from 2002 to 2014, when the museum first started tracking its research requests, on average, 260 researchers and 4,000 students per year have made use of the collections for scholarship probably many of them Laurel students looking for tortillas. 
Over 180 exhibits, both on the Harvard campus and in loans, have shown hundreds of objects uh, to the public. And to be sure, there are seemingly endless objects awaiting rediscovery in the university's museum collections in the years ahead. As a research institution, the Peabody Museum's collections continue to be renewed and activated by engaging with communities around the globe through research and exhibits, such as sharing these historic 19th century photographs from the Peabody collection with the community that was captured in them many years ago. Today's object is one, but one, but one of many examples that my colleagues at the museums could uh, use to expand on this subject today. So now let's take a look at the chosen object, which was discovered at Copan, Honduras in 1892 during the Peabody Museum expedition to Central America. It is an 8th century Maya stone carving in several segments that was originally set into a stairway of hieroglyphs detailing the dynastic history of the site on each of its 64 steps, representing what is believed to be Ruler 13, named Huashaklahuna Bakawil, the ruler is depicted as a warrior on a stairway that initially was built to commemorate his father, Ruler 12, and sealed his burial location. Ironically, decades later, the upper second half of the stairway was constructed after the capture and beheading of Ruler 13. In total, there are five seated figures gracing the stairway, but by the 1890s, all but one had fallen from its placement having been dislodged during earthquakes. The carved inscription also car suffered the same fate, so much for dynastic history. When the Peabody Museum expedition uncovered the collapsed hieroglyphic stairway in 1892, they had negotiated a concession with the hunter and government that permitted them to transport half of their findings back to Harvard for a period of 10 years. The seated figure was trimmed down with saws to lighten the load, which must have been considerable when carried on the backs of workmen to the port city of Isabel, Guatemala. The work was risky on many levels. Smallpox, yellow fever, and malaria were rampant in the region, and the expedition director, John Owens, a Harvard graduate student, contracted yellow fever and died in the rural village. Peabody Museum director Frederick Putnam had set forth the young expedition team to, quote, work in perfect harmony for the best results of science, unquote motivating them to acquire objects for scientific, archaeological, and ethnographic studies, and to highlight these obscure cultures at the world's Columbian Exposition. Nevertheless, in our century, when it is no longer legally permissible or deemed ethically correct to remove objects out of their countries of origins, their acts can be misconstrued as a thin veil for the popularity of collecting curiosities. In the 19th century, then, we see the seated figure, on the one hand, became something of a cultural ambassador for Honduran culture, and on another, a scientific prize for the university. The Harvard concession was not renewed in 1900, in large measure because the Peabody Museum had not fulfilled a part of the concession to the satisfaction of the Honduran government, which was to construct an on-site museum in Copan, instead trying to pass off this pole and thatch rancho as sufficient for the job. Nevertheless, 100 years later, Harvard came through with assistance and expertise to construct the Copan Sculpture Museum, which today protects the monuments and educates the public and school children in the purpose and meaning of ancient sculptural arts. 35 years after the Peabody excavation seized, the Carnegie Institution of Washington embarked on a collaborative project with the government of Honduras to excavate and repair monuments at the site. One project was to carry out a reconstruction of the stairway, and in so doing, they left a space for the Peabody seated figure, merely guessing as to its placement. With that action, the object became a distant missing entity, no longer an ambassador or even able to be visually recalled by any living inhabitant at Copan. Nevertheless, it loomed in the consciousness of locals as a long lost relative. The vacant space on the steps, a constant reminder of its absence, Though countless other sculptures had been removed from the site illegally by locals and foreigners at that time, paradoxically, they went unheeded as the focus zeroed in on the legally removed stairway figure, most likely due to its prominent placeholder on the steps and the Harvard name associated with it. Joining 38 other museum lenders in 1970, the Peabody Museum loaned the figure and several other sculptures for Cop from Copan for the centennial exhibit at the Met called Before Cortez. 
On its return to the Peabody, it was installed on the third floor, where it remained on public exhibit until 2010, when it was deinstalled for 3D scanning and maintenance. The hope was to return the it, object to exhibit when up, with updated information in 2011. However, it currently remains in storage. For centuries, the stairway has captivated scholars in attempts to decipher its message and put it back in order. My contributions to the cause began in 1978 with the first technically accurate documentation and continues today with conservation efforts, local training, archival research, 3D documentation, and studies of the inscription with a team of epigraphers using the digitized photographs from the Peabody Museum's 19th century glass plate images. Now armed with an ever-increasing body of fresh decipherments to apply to the text, it is 80% deciphered. Several years ago, the figure and glyphs were scanned in 3D ordered um, to complete a virtual reconstruction of the monumental staircase. 3D printing of the inscription is now in progress to aid in reordering the steps and to eventually fabricate a replica of its correct order for the museum in Copan. These rapid changes in technology importantly change the way we think about and use the objects collected in the past. The actuality of the situation is that the original stairway has now suffered heavy erosion, while the figure and glyph blocks at the Peabody remain in pristine condition. These blocks and details on the old photographs and on, with the details on the old photographs together with the 3D models help us to reconstruct missing glyphic elements. This past summer, a Harvard undergraduate tested the remains of plaster on the surface of the sculptures at the site for evidence of color as a case study for her senior thesis in the History of Art and Architecture Department. Her work confirmed that the figures were once stuccoed and painted as she found imperceptible traces of rare blue pigment on the Quetzal feather headdress of one of the figures and red pigment on the risers. The accessibility and excellent condition of the figure at Harvard allowed her to use non-invasive optical analysis before conducting the analytical sampling in the field. The figure, once again, an instrument of science to inform on the past. Disseminating our findings at conferences and exhibitions, both at Harvard and in Copan, allows for the academic ritual of sharing historical knowledge of a World Heritage Site, an act far removed in time and purpose from original activation rituals of the ancient Maya. Partnering with local organizations to provide responsible care for the stairway carries the figure into a new focus as a placeholder in time bringing archeological and museum scholarship together with the local public to collectively preserve a mutual history and advance scientific knowledge about the past. These new studies have revived an interest in the conservation and interpretation of the monument locally, and in my mind, reactivate the essence of the eighth century figure as an embodiment of the Maya ancestors through space and time, and expands the university's collection to new dimensions beyond the walls of the college itself. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you to Keo and Julie for putting together such a magnificent conference. Um, my paper today is actually an artifact of my engagement with the Harvard map collection, which is a collection where I am not particularly comfortable but I was happily forced into it by the closure of the art museums and the consequent inaccessibility of almost everything in that collection for quite a long period of time. Uh, so one door closed of the art museums for at least 12 months, and I think it was useful for all of us to spread out across campus and visit and work with other collections. So in December of 1733 in London, Henry Popple published a map of the British Empire in America with the French and Spanish settlements adjacent thereto. Drawn on the Mercator projection, it showed a massive expanse of territory in the Americas between 5 and 55 degrees latitude. Very large scale maps like this covering the whole sweep of the colonial territories were strategically important as the European powers struggled over the continent's control during this period. If the map was large scale, it was also simply large size. In fact, it was the single largest map printed in England during the 18th century. The image I'm showing you on the screen looks like a single page, but in fact, the map was printed on 20 sheets of imperial size paper. 
When joined and mounted together, usually on a piece of linen to form a full wall map, the sheets measured about eight feet square. One could display one's map this way if you had sufficient wall space, but you could also purchase it as loose sheets or bound in an atlas. To my knowledge, Harvard owns three copies of this map. Two are in the form of loose sheets in the Harvard map collection, and one is in the form of an atlas at Houghton. What did Harvard intend to collect when it collected this map? Why was it valuable? Certainly the primary reason for collecting maps is the geographical information that they convey. In the Popple map, this might include vital information about British strategic strongholds in the Caribbean, information about enemy French territories in the upper Midwest, maritime information of all sorts, and here's a section of the map showing some soundings around the Grand Banks. As this map, or any map, ages, this cartographic knowledge shifts from fresh information into historical knowledge, revealing the state of past understandings of territories. Regardless, for all intents and purposes, Popple's map has been more useful to the university as information than as object. It has been valued for the inscriptions upon it. Little would seem to be lost if that information could somehow be peeled away from its material support, held up in a gossamer web of pure inscriptions that might move seamlessly into other forms and formats. And of course, this is precisely what has happened in the reproduction and recent digitization of this map. Every sheet of this map has been exhaustively scanned and preserved in zoomable format on a website called davidrumsey.com, which I'm sure all the cartographers in the audience are very familiar with, which is now directly linked to in Hollis. And this is precisely, of course, what is happening now as I'm speaking in my PowerPoint presentation, where Popple's map has been decoupled from its material support in order to float in a relatively elastic electronic space. And why not? Maps are inherently about plotting and scaling, both of which are central to the digital enterprise, to virtualization, to visualization. Scalability in particular is relevant here. Maps are the very definition of scalable information. And when we say that something is scalable, we mean that its material agency is essentially quiescent. Maps have made a seemingly seamless leap into the digital world because they already articulate the infinitely scalable condition of digital space. Maps, in other words, were practically born digital as it is. And yet Harvard still has its paper copies of Popple's map. It has kept them as part of its inconvenient collections of space hogging material objects. Why is this? One reason that universities do or should collect and keep things and not just surrogates is the faith that other forms of knowledge, other kinds of information might be lurking in the bodies of these things, unnoticed, perhaps undetectable, but potentially meaningful later. And here I'm just reiterating something that Anne Blair very beautifully uh, argued this morning. I've become increasingly interested in the latent knowledge about making that lies in every human-made object that Harvard has ever collected. Whatever the ostensible forms of knowledge captured in Harvard's vast collections, these collections harbor a largely untapped knowledge about craft, engineering, and material science, the intelligence of maker, makers and of matter. And this is just an example of one of the single sheets of this map. Maps tell us about the cartographic imagination of their moment, but also about the imagination of etchers and engravers and printers and paper makers. The inscriptive content on maps, that scalable, calculable, immaterial information, requires, in fact, immense skill and material knowledge in order to be brought into being. And indeed, it's the expert manipulation of materials that permits the apparent retreat of, material, of materiality uh, in the map itself. To think through this, I want to return to this issue of scalability that I mentioned earlier. At the level of information, scale is not supposed to matter. You can zoom in and out of a map without changing its meaning. But at the level of matter and making, scale is a crucial variable, one that makes all the difference in the ability of a map to function. To give just one example, a deep and complex engagement with the scale of inscriptions on the copper plate was necessary in order to create significant information on Popple's finished map. The copper plates used for intaglio printing are delicate and highly impressionable. They're soft enough that the slightest scratch, even a fingerprint or the texture of a cloth, will be picked up by the plate, receive ink, and then show up on the finished print. This is why a key step in any map making process was the laborious polishing of that plate to a mirror finish using a series of finer and finer grained cloths. 
One of the hallmarks of a fine engraving was the clean white page ground that resulted from what we might call good plate hygiene, a carefully, laboriously polished plate then wiped of all stray ink. Of course, the degree of, of purity and smoothness of a polished surface is highly dependent on the scale at which one considers that surface. Indeed, all intaglio prints bear tiny scratches and pockmarks somewhere, symptoms of the limitation of the polishing tools and artifacts of the living surface of the copper. The practice of polishing could not hope to remove all marks absolutely, but rather only to drive those marks down below the threshold of attention, or at least to drive them down below the threshold at which they might be mistaken for intentionally engraved marks. In other words, these scratches must be small enough that they lurk below the threshold of, a, of significance in the register of error and noise along with, say, the flecks of color in the rag paper. They should signify only the raw background materiality of the printing process. We see here that the fundamental boundary between meaning and materiality, information and noise, is patrolled by the skills of map printers and especially by their sensitivity to the scale of the materials with which they work. This skill, this work, is something akin to what we would call today information labor, expertise and skill largely invisible that goes into creating the conditions necessary for information to emerge. In an art print or a printed text, it may not matter whether a scratch intrudes upon the scene. An epistemological crisis would not erupt. But in a map, much more is at stake in distinguishing the semiotic content of the map from the grain of the materials. A pock or a scratch placed just so might create an ambiguous island or peninsula or deform a crucial political boundary. As the scale of the map is reduced, or in other words, as the meaningful marks become smaller and smaller in relation to the grain of the materials, this, this threshold becomes more and more narrow and sensitive, and any ding in the surface of the plate threatens to suggest itself as cartographically significant. A good example is here in the general area of Bermuda on the key map that Popple published along with his large map. Here we're beginning to approach the limit at which common printing or polishing glitches adopt the same scale as cartographic marks. What is that double speck over there a few miles west of the island? Is it a tiny pock in the copper plate that has picked up some ink, or is it a massive rock that will sink your ship? It's actually almost impossible to tell simply by looking at the map. The more I stared at this mark on this map, for example, the more it bothered me. You know, is that a pock or a rock? It bothered me so much that I actually went on Google Maps to see if there was, in fact, an island over there. I don't think there actually is. Given this epistemological uncertainty around scale um, uh, making an error, I want to conclude with a cluster of scratches that I found on the Popple map about two years ago while poring over the sheets in the map collection. This is sheet 11 of Popple's map. It is almost completely empty of genuine cartographic information. It shows a portion of the Atlantic Ocean that is populated almost entirely by an empty graticule, a compass rose, an interrupted phrase, and a series of etched ships. The map bears true geographical knowledge about only one tiny piece of land, Bermuda there, visible here um, in a colored copy of the map as a blue dot. <coughs> there is a faint smudge on the margin of this sheet, below the second A in Atlantic. It's easy to miss because although it's tucked within the plate mark area, it lies outside of the inscribed grid of the sheet, outside, in other words, the part of the print that is designated as the information bearing area. On each of the sheets of the map, this tenuous border zone tends to be populated by scratches and smudges. Since it didn't bear meaningful cartographic significance, this part of the plate was not generally polished or burnished as carefully as other parts. Moreover, situated as it was along the edges of the copper plate, it was more prone to fingerprints and other artifacts of handling and manipulation in the printing process. Indeed, the smudge is about the size of a small fingerprint made by the end of a pinky finger. So this smudge occupies a kind of space that is the very definition of insignificant. It's a rift, a non-space made insignificant by virtue of its position in the map's territories of information. And given that it lies on the edge of the near empty Bermuda sheet, which as we have seen is already the most marginal sheet on the map, the one least likely to attract the attention of seekers of cartographic knowledge, it's fair to say that this smudge might be the most inconspicuous mark on the entire massive expanse of the Popple map. Indeed, I have not come across any mention of this mark in the large literature on the map. 
although writers on Popple's map have obsessively cataloged every inscription on every sheet in every state of the engraving. This particular mark has escaped notice. But this is actually a very interesting mark, a very significant little smudge. Because there, barely differentiable from the accidental surface wear on the plate, a few delicate lines scratched lightly with an etching needle resolve unmistakably into a face. A face looks out from this matrix of materials. How many viewers over the past 300 years have actually returned its gaze? Its very existence on Harvard's map is evidence, in fact, of its not having been noticed. It's etched onto the plate, and it was printed, as far as I can tell, on every copy of the map from the first edition, first state, the copy given to the King of England, through to at least the eighth, and Harvard owns a seventh and eighth state of this map. No one involved in the publishing of the map, in other words, probably saw it, or at least no one cared to remove it, and it would have been very simple to do that just 10 seconds with a burnisher. I've not yet been able to determine the identity behind this apparition. If we imagine it to be a self-portrait, it's hard to say who it might be. I would wager that it's not a self-portrait of any of the principal engravers or artists of the map, most likely a subordinate etcher working in the engraving workshop. At any rate, I suspect that we're more true to its function if we think of it not as a standard portrait, but as a personification of the material agency of the map, an agency which includes the tacit intelligence of the maker working in concert with that material. The face lies so perfectly between insignificant scratch and significant mark, error and information, matter and symbol, that it could only result from a virtuosic practical understanding of the grain and the feel of copper and paper and ink could only have been made by someone who knew exactly how and where to make it so that it would be visible to some people but not to others. This face is invisible, illegible in the informational frame of cartography, but it has a great deal to say about matter and making and all of their associated knowledges. A working stowaway on the ship of informational knowledge, in looking out, it stands for another way of looking at Harvard's collections. Thank you. Thank you, Keo. Thank you, Julie, for a great uh, conference. It's wonderful to be here. Um, well, when when the Harvard Art Museums opened its doors again, it opened its doors in November, after nearly six years of uh, renovation, during which time, as uh, we learned, you learn a lot from the objects that you you don't get to see. Uh, the museums were presented with a challenge of uh, giving a changed and enlarged building a new identity, or rather new identities, because there are three museums. There's the Fogg, the Sackler, uh, and the Bush Reisinger Museum. Uh, I've had, of the three, most to do with the Bush Reisinger Museum, and uh, the Bush probably has the most troubling identity uh, of all, uh, not least of all because its holdings overlap with those of the Fogg. The Fogg collects um, Western art from the Middle Ages to the present. The Bush collects art from that very same period, but from, quote, Central and Northern Europe with an emphasis on German-speaking countries, which is Western art, too, but I suppose with a difference. So the Bush's spatial and chronological topology overlaps with the fogs, and in fact, most people still call that building over there the fog, uh, and works from the Bush now hang in the fog rooms in the building. Anyway, uh, to give a face to the building, to display visibly and physically an identity to this discrete museum, the curators marked the room specifically dedicated to the bush uh, with this painting, uh, and their decision self-evidently makes sense. It's the most famous work of the bush. I understand also the most frequently uh, requested for loans uh, it's an iconic work, to use that o overused term, which undergraduates use for almost everything, iconic. And it's iconic of the Bush Reisinger. It's iconic of Max Beckmann. It's iconic of expressionism, I would say. And it's uh, arguably a kind of icon of the Weimar Republic, of an entire uh, era uh, in the history of Germany. In, Bush, in the Bush now, uh, the Beckmann presides over a historical and historical trajectory that goes from Vienna, Viennese modernism, uh, via uh, the uh, uh, room with Beckmann to the Bauhaus, 
and Beckmann and the German Expressionist mo moment would be the climax of that story, as indeed most outsiders uh, think of German art as having a climax in Dürer, let's say, and then in German Expressionism. So it all makes sense um, indeed. From afar, in fact, it looks less like an artist's portrait than one of those portraits you see at the opening of collections like the Thyssen Museum where the donor is represented uh, in a uh, portrait. It looks not like an artist, but really like a patron. Uh, and indeed, critics in 19, uh, you could think it might be a portrait of uh, Mr. Bush, uh, the uh, beer magnet. And indeed, critics in 1927, uh, uh, when the picture was first displayed in the Berlin Secession, uh, said that the artist painted himself like a young baron of, his, of industry. I can't do justice with the impact of this person or this persona uh, because um, uh, it, it's, it's quite complex and you really have to be there and teach it and feel it to get it, but I'll just suggest a few features. One of the features that makes it so compelling is the casualness with which Beckmann confronts us, with his hand on his hip, uh, the cigarette working, the two bring the body together, uh, he can stand there a long time, the cigarette gives himself something to do, probably now he would, because he can't smoke in the galleries, he'd probably be looking at his cell phone, uh, but he's not looking at his cell phone, he's looking at us, and that's of course the other incredible aspect of it, this confrontational relationship to the viewer, uh, in which it seems too intimate, and at the same time uh, uh, too intimate to be friendly, uh, it almost has an aggressive aspect to it. And if anybody paints, you'll know it's very hard to uh, paint uh, a likeness, frontal likeness, that's the reason why people always do three quarters, uh, it's natural to self-portraiture, but in this case, the frontal likeness, as we'll see, gives rise to a peculiarly complex kind of image uh, of the face. But lastly, uh, of the, uh, of the f main formal features of the work are those, cl those clothes, the black tuxedo, which makes one, as one comes into the gallery, always feel a little bit underdressed in comparison to Beckmann, unless you happen to be at an opening of a museum, in which case you might be wearing a tuxedo, but he's already there, he can leave, he can move out of the door. Again, the sense that he belongs there, that he knows what he's doing, uh, and that you aren't an audience to him, uh, but he is giving you an audience. That's the sort of general sense uh, that the picture gives. He belongs, we don't. What a better uh, image for the Bush Reisinger to place itself uh, in the museum and to place in front of it this picture that so much belongs. But the tuxedo signals a certain kind of belonging. The Viennese critic and architect Adolf Loos captured this in his commentary on men's clothing, and he said, an article of dress is modern if, when wearing it on a particular occasion, in the best society, at the center of one's culture, one attracts as little attention as possible to oneself. Loos wrote this in 1898, and what he means is that somehow one should disappear into the woodwork, but only at the center of society, which would mean a party for him in London or in New York. He says that if you actually show up in Vienna wearing Viennese clothes, you will, be, you will stand out, because he's suggesting that Viennese are always weirdly, locally, provincially dressed. The point is, uh, that Loos was making is to become a cosmopolitan, to disappear, and that being the mark of a modern person. A modern person doesn't show themselves in their clothes, you disappear into the backdrop. Max Beckmann wrote something similar, 1927, many years later, in the painting, in, the, uh, in a uh, essay uh, exactly contemporary with the painting, and he said, the new priests of this cultural uh, center must be dressed in dark suits or on a state occasion appear in tuxedo. He means by priests, the artists, he, their religion is a religion of God as man, of self. Um, and why are artists priests? Because they're shapers. And what they shape is identity. And how they shape it isn't simply some kind of metaphysical thing, but by the way an artist paints, they shape a new identity. So why the tuxedo? Because Beckman argues that a tuxedo is what you wear in a uh, affair of state, and so what he's doing wearing that tuxedo is he is embodying state formation, the way the artist can be by the way they paint and by the way they are the creators of a new kind of state. 
And the new kind of state that Bequin is imagining is a European state that is balanced between powers, hence the balance of the composition. It's all very programmatic, and it should be centered like the centered body should be centered, but not in any capital in Paris, London, Vienna, or Berlin. It should be centered in the central person, in the modern person, and should be therefore not a polis, but a cosmopolis. Nice picture then for the fog, that cosmopolitan collection. But how does it come to be in the Bush Risinger, a collection which has to do with local identities? Well, the university acquired the painting in 1941 in the moment which couldn't have been less cosmopolitan, the moment of the greatest uh, uncentered, the greatest violently unbalanced moment in the 20th century uh, in the West. So how, did, so how did then the Bush acquire the picture? Very briefly, it was uh, adored when it was purchased, when it was uh, shown by mo many uh, of the um, critics of the time. It was understood to be a representation of a new persona, a new mask, the mask of a modern person, a person who was mobile and with the time, modern in the sense of modernity, in, the, in Baudelaire's sense. Um, it was a balanced self, but a self internally balanced in itself. It was immediately acquired by uh, the uh, art critic Julius uh, Meyer Grefe, and then it was acquired by the National Gallery in uh, in Berlin where it was given its own room. Incredibly important painting then. Hitler comes to power, institutions come under party control, especially institutions of culture, and a cultural revolution uh, uh, erupts from the right. Um, and at this moment, the enemy is seen to be precisely the modern, modernist artist. It took some years for this to take, uh, to take shape in the form that it did, uh, but in 1937, uh, four years after Hitler's seizure of power, it took spectacular form in the exhibition Degenerate Art and Arte de Kunst. For me, the, the teaching moment about art collecting as, in fact, artists, artworks are being gathered and displayed to be vilified and destroyed. And Arte in German has a much more racialist meaning. It means something like the idea that uh, Culture has become degenerate because of a racial problem. The racial problem is the intermingling of races and particularly the Jewish component of the German, uh, of the German culture made it no longer local, but it made it global. It made it mobile, nomadic, rootless, and it was this rootlessness which, the, uh, which was identified with modern painting, with modernity, um, and uh, was uh, exhibited in this peculiar way. Uh, and r reports are that uh, people actually were forced to laugh while they passed through the uh, rooms. Otherwise, they might be watched for some other uh, political belief. Um, you see how the argument goes. It's a very amazing for uh, we art historians. It says, no commentary is necessary suggesting that we do need commentary. And what does that mean, no commentary is necessary? But it's an interesting uh, feature, especially when we look and find works from the Harvard collections in the exhibition of degenerate art, in which now we have a different commentary than the one that is, uh, says no commentary uh, is necessary. There's the, uh, the Nolde uh, in the um, foreground. So the result? Works were exhibited in the uh, Antarctic Kunstausstellung. They were deaccessioned. They were put on auction. There's the uh, room where the Van Gogh was placed, a degenerate work of art, so it called, uh, put on auction. There it's being sold uh, and uh, distributed through the world. So that's the reason why it's not there anymore. And that's the reason partly why it's here. But that doesn't explain, so why did Harvard buy this picture? Harvard, uh, the Bush Reisinger Museum, was a museum of plaster casts and of photographs. It was a museum dedicated uh, around the turn of the last century to uh, foster a sense of German identity among American Germans uh, by uh, Kaiser Wilhelm. It was ill-fated. The World War II broke out almost upon opening, uh, and it was always searching about for an identity. Uh, and when the Second World War uh, broke out, uh, another identity, sorry, another identity was found. 
an identity uh, wherein, uh, first of all, uh, like the fog, reproductions would no longer be collected, but original works of art. And in fact, the Beckman is the first modern work of art that the Bush ever uh, uh, purchased. But what a strange and amazing and faded beginning to have this work, which was effectively uh, bought as the other Germany, the non-German Germany, the cosmopolitan Germany of men wearing tuxedos, now exiled from the country, but now becoming a symbol of the country, defining uh, the country in exile as devoted to a cosmopolitan ideal, and therefore so interestingly fitting in a museum which constantly tries the Bush to redefine its identity. One of the great things about the Bush is the fact that it has to redefine its identity. It's one of the things that I ha think it has a, an advantage over the fog, which thinks that identity is just a neutral thing, a cosmopolitan thing, whereas the Bush has to constantly renegotiate identity. This wouldn't, though, be a, um, a conference about the, uh, the eloquence of objects if it weren't for the fact that all of this really is contained, and more than contained, outdone, transcended, made problematic, made visual, made visible, made talkable through the painting itself. The way one can talk about balance and unbalance, one can talk about painting uh, and politics just looking at a thumb of one of the pictures, one of the uh, pictures details. Um, or for example, the way the uh, whole frontal uh, representation of the body is as it were negotiated, crossed out by the radical splitting of the body into two parts, into the black and the white, a splitting which goes right through the face. What an incredibly strange uh, counterintuitive move to place at the front of, uh, center of your face this fragmenting uh, device uh, of shadow and light, of chiaroscuro, which doesn't unite and embody, but fragments. Uh, and transforms. And what a better emblem of the attempt to belong and at the same time to be fragmented, to be at home and at the same time be in a state of exile than a painting that does this, and that does this as all my uh, undergraduates standing in front of this picture in countless uh, discussions will always point to, countless uh, discussions of that cigarette which burns and makes us always feel that the picture is right now, happening right now, that that modernity is still burning right now in us. And I think it's a modernity which always also brings into question what we're doing in the museum, what a collection is, what a university, what a wonderful place a university is that you can ask these questions of one little bit like that cigarette in the Beckman. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to thank our, our four speakers for, uh, again, a really dynamic set of talks which um, bring very, I would say, uh, a differing set of concerns and sensibilities to the objects they examine, but there nevertheless are quite a few uniting uh, elements to the talks as well. And in the spirit of starting off the question and answer session, and I invite everybody to please come up to the uh, microphone which is set up in the aisle and uh, to ask questions. I wanted to uh, ask a, a, a quick question of our, of our panelists, uh, which was um, provoked uh, to a certain extent by some of the uh, images that came up during the presentation uh, in uh, Joseph's talk, the, the kind of disturbing photo of uh, the forced laughter in front of the paintings and the degenerate uh, art exhibit, but um, we are all dealing with uh, these uh, remarkable objects, which uh, uh, in certain ways, but it made me wonder um, what kinds of uh, intangible uh, practices, the kind of embodied practices uh, that uh, they also kind of convey or evoke that um, they may be a slight trace of, but really otherwise don't leave any any traces at, at all? Are there kinds of uh, embodied forms of, of transmission of culture and memory and, and history that are also part of the stories of these objects that would kind of uh, animate them uh, even further uh, in the spirit of um, this uh, panel and this symposium on university as collector? I wanted to direct this question to, to our panelists and maybe ask uh, Ethan if you could just start us off. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, th I suppose I have a few thoughts on that. Uh, 
One object that uh, I, I talked about this deposit of material from the first American circumnavigation. And just yesterday, actually, we were looking at the Peabody Museum at Labritz, the lip ornaments which they collected by the uh, tens, really, on the northwest coast uh, that women wore. And one of the Labritz had a, a big break in the center that had been repaired. And uh, it brought uh, to mind for me the fact that when we think of our collections and objects today, we were wearing gloves as we handled this thing. And touch is a violated, uh, almost a kind of violated um, method of engagement, at least from an art museum perspective. But that the universe of philosophy chamber objects, at least, was one of um, constant, constant handling and movement and wheeling and uh, passing and presumably dropping. And it made me wonder if that labyrinth had fractured actually at Harvard, not on its journey around the world, uh, seemed like a likely story. And I think the art on the wall that I showed too was um, being jostled against, being moved around on the wall, uh, and uh, the kind of uh, the, the value or the way we uh, revere this stuff seems to be different. Well, I think you can think of that in the terms of the um, the Maya sculpture as well. It was carried in here, you know, wrapped in uh, banana leaves and things like that. Um, and you know, we still find when when we were doing the optical analysis, you know, we found little brown pieces of those uh, leaves still stuck to the uh, stone surface. So, you know, things are handled very differently now. But I think um, one thing that happens at a university in the, in the collection that um, wouldn't necessarily happen elsewhere is that the student involvement is, is very serendipitous. Um, you know, you can't tell when it's going to resonate with someone and what their background is. And, um, you know, there's been occasions where student classes have come through the mesolab and, you know, we talk about things or we go to the annex and see objects. Um, and that's when things happen, when people start asking questions uh, and then you don't, you realize you don't know the answer or you need to dig further and then that becomes their research topic. So, um, you know, that was how the Fragile Memory exhibit really took uh, form as a graduate student working with me said, who are these people in the photos? And that's how we found out who that man was standing next to the figure. So I think that's the, the wonder of, of working, uh, having these collections at the university is being able to have that kind of serendipitous uh, occasion happen. You might call it the uh, practice of classroom or pedagogical comportment to a certain extent, <laughs> brings them to life. Um, I would, I, I, I was struck by how um, both jo Joseph and I were talking about a certain labor of disappearance that goes into objects that you know any art object or artifact uh, it shows something, but that's always by virtue of not showing something else, that these objects work very hard not to show some things, whether it's um, how that clean white background paper was made or um, how one wears a tuxedo to blend in rather than to be conspicuous. And so um, I like to think about, uh, about the sort of negative space around objects as something that is also defined by them in some way. Um, and you can think of that too in terms of these sort of embodied rituals that surround objects, uh, which would be perhaps completely lost to us if we didn't have the object as this kind of empty center of those rituals that, that will at least make it possible to ask questions about the sort of lost gestures or movements that animated it in the past. So I would say we still need the objects in order to even to ask about what they can't show us. Uh, I think one of the um, amazing features of painting and why despite all the times when everybody thinks that painting is dead, painting continues to go on, is that it, uh, it makes you think that there's nothing that you're not supposed to look at. Everything, and I just take, take that cigarette, but, it's just there for you to look at. It's about its being there for you to look at, and he thought a lot about it, and if it wasn't there, the whole picture would, wouldn't work. On the other hand, uh, looking at the history of art, you see how often uh, what, uh, people's understanding of the image uh, is very limited, like the, the amazing uh, face, because of the people uh, looking at the map, they miss the face. 
Uh, and in, in, to me, one of the most uh, dramatic experiences of that was that was discovered by an art historian, rather postmodern art historian, uh, Georges Didi Ubermann, when he pointed out that uh, for Angelicos are routinely uh, photographed and reproduced only the image, whereas all around them are spackling of marble, sort of pseudo marble. It's all painted marble. And everybody thought that's not part of the work, but actually it's a part of the work and it's probably the deepest part of the work because it's like abstract painting avant la lettre. It, it, it has a symbolism about the, uh, about the passion, about the uh, milk of the Virgin Mary, around the tomb of Christ, about the sarcophagus, but it's our own framework that didn't make us see that, uh, that upfrontness of the painting. The most painted part of the picture, that it's not an illusion, is in fact the whole center. Uh, and I think that, that is, um, I th as an art historian, I find that a, a nice thing to work with is that art really is, really, is a lot about showing and looking. It was made to be shown and you look. But at the same time, therefore, when something comes up that's concealed uh, and that only time reveals, either historical time or time looking at it, it's very exciting. And I think in a you know, digital world that we now inhabit, that's one of the reasons why uh, museums have uh, taken on such a different character because I think everyone who goes into a museum and students particularly when they're in front of a physical work get all sorts of minor and sometimes major experiences by simply slowing down and getting into the pace of an actual physical thing uh, and it's just something very exciting uh, but unique to the the field great thank you well in in that spirit we're inviting uh, speakers to to ask questions, and please, uh, if you could state your name and affiliation when Hi. you ask the question. Sure, uh, my name is Chris Bierfeldt, um, and I'm, a, I'm an outsider, I'm an editor at Historic New England. Um, this question is uh, primarily for Ethan. Um, I arrived a little late today just as the uh, audience member was asking a question about you know, gender disparity in the uh, portraits at Brigham uh, in women. And um, so, of course, in the uh, sample that you showed from the philosophy chamber, you know, it's nine wealthy white men. Um, and certainly one of the messages I received from that is this space is not for you, you know. Um, recognizing what Professor Van Valkenburg said about that being a part of the history of the collection history of the institution, um, how do you sort of recreate that experience and recreate that space without sort of perpetuating or, or, or ratifying that kind of message? Um, is that something that you're talking about and considering as you um, plan the exhibition? Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly something on our mind and a good question. Uh, the same question in some ways applies to how you frame, say, a gift from the Pacific or from Native American artifacts being brought in as uh, sort of trophies or imperialist trophies in 1790. How do you uh, get into the history of this collection without um, being sensed, you know, being thinking about that but not uh, rehearsing it. So I, I think, first of all, the, the story of women in a philosophy chamber is more complicated than it seems. Uh, there are uh, a few uh, a few donations, the space is all donation, and we know that some women were among the donors, particularly of natural history collections. And we also know that they were uh, members, attendees of some of the lectures that went on in the space. Uh, but we can't get around the wall, and uh, the wall is actually more male than even I alluded, because it has, I, I didn't show like six of the uh, marble bus gazing back, and uh, we're, we're trying to understand uh, what it was to be a student in 1799 and what that was saying and who it was saying to and who it was saying did not belong in this space is I think as important uh, and even more clear a narrative than uh, what it, who it says to the people who are to belong. So it's uh, something we're investigating that that wall as jammed as it is is as much about exclusion as inclusion. Uh, in, in terms of who it's talking to. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I just want to recount an experience. I, uh, one of the ways you learn to paint is you copy paintings. And actually, I was asked by a friend uh, to make a copy of the Max Beckman mm -hmm. portrait in a tuxedo. And in fact, I was commissioned to put his face where Max Beckman's <laughs> face was. <laughs> um, this was a wonderful challenge. Um, but he wanted it life-size. He wanted it uh, framed similarly. He wanted an exact copy. I even said, uh, do you want a cigarette? And he said, yes. Um, and I must say, it does now hang in this dining room in Manchester. Uh, his kids <laughs> think it's hilarious. 
Um, but the reason I bring it up is because it is about uh, what you made reference to. Um, I wanted to copy the palette exactly. And I'd ask any of you to think about how you, as a painter, would go about making the exact palette that Beckman used. So at first, I took my camera, took, it was legal, uh, <laughs> took a picture, and I realized the camera doesn't. It, it, right. it fools around with colors. And, and then when I printed it out, it, it came out. To, so I said, oh, well, well I'll, I'll buy a postcard uh, from the uh, Harvard Art Museum and take home, well, two of the postcards didn't exactly match. And um, they didn't look right to my eye. So I said, well, let's go online. And I look up Max Beckman's portrait in tuxedo. And you pull up maybe 25 images, all of which are different. Mm -hmm. And which one do I use? And I realized there is no way I could figure out the palette mm -hmm. short of going there and bringing my paints with me, which was not legal. Mm -hmm. So I took my best shot, but it meant that I had to go back frequently to look at it and, and actually bring a little palette of what I'd done and see whether it looked right in the right light, which mm -hmm. is another problem, because uh, the light in my studio is different from the light in the gallery. And I'll just say, it's, it taught me the uh, seductive inadequacy of digital imagery, that there is no way to figure out the palette of the Max Beckman portrait short of actually going there. Yes. That, yes. I'm not sure it's a question, but... No, but it's, a, it's a, a great comment, and it raises an issue which you see when you're looking at it as any, and, and using it as an object of conversation, that as you move back and forth an inch or so, certain bits of the, of the face and of the painting are uh, more shiny than the, than the others, and that it's not just a matter of color, it's a matter of sheen. And that, because it's all invested with this huge explicit weight of history, the fact that that sheen and that unbalance is intended to uh, embody what we are as modern people, mobile, uh, transitory. It gives a great, uh, both allegorical, I suppose, but also extremely straightforward understanding of the way in which painting is this incredibly elusive medium that not only as you say, can't be a photograph, but no one photograph could, could uh, capture it because it's actually, you have to be mobile to actually see the painting, despite the fact that it's so frontal. Uh, and that's a, uh, uh, and, and thank, uh, thank you for that uh, first-hand field work. <laughs> Yes. I'm sorry, I couldn't help myself. Uh, I'm Lynette Roth. Lynette. I'm the curator of the Bush Reisinger Museum. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Um, I wanted to add it was not a very um, difficult decision to make, obviously, to hang the Beckmon where it now hangs in the new uh, building. Uh, and actually, it, it brings up the question, I think, that's kind of um, surrounding a lot of what we've been talking about so far uh, during this part of the, the day, and that's about the sort of interest really in historiography and our own interest also as curators, as art historians, in our own history, sort of the history of art history and the history of our own institutions. And obviously, the Bush Reisinger Museum, um, as you so rightly noted, sort of has to kind of deal with its own history um, because it is um, so unique and so fraught um, and this sort of constant idea of reinventing itself. And there's this amazing photograph, uh, which I found in the Bush Reisinger Museum archive, that actually shows the Max Beckmann when it first was shown uh, by the museum in 1940, even before it was purchased by the museum, um, in an exhibition uh, in which you sort of see it in historic Adolphus Bush Hall, uh, flanked on either side by plaster casts of the synagogue um, and, um, and the church, um, plaster casts which have actually since, those plaster casts um, have since, one is in storage uh, and one is on display now in Adolphus Bush Hall. So this question that even Ethan brought up, and I think also um, uh, uh, Jennifer and Joseph of um, decline. You know why the de why we make the decisions we make, um, and the kind of record um, that we can find in our own archives and our own. Um, um, institutions that actually then bears um, 
quite a, a sort of, at least for me, um, that photograph of the Beckmont in that situation, surrounded by the foundational um, Bush Reisinger collection, sort of captured everything that I was trying to get at. In fact, I, I use it all the time because I think actually this image taken in 1940 is a better explanation of the Bush Reisinger Museum than I could maybe even give. Um, and yet we don't think about those plaster casts in the same way. I noticed on Ethan's list most of the works that had disappeared were indeed the plaster casts. Um, and that's something that we're exploring now as well for the, for the Bush Reisinger collection. How can we actually think about those foundational collections, the question of the reproduction, the way that these collections were actually founded on, you know, really the idea in many ways of the replica. Um, so that's also more of a, a comment than a question. But I would actually be interested to know how much, you know, this idea of um, as a university, as, col as collector, you know, is there really a limit to historiography? I mean, when are we going, when are we just kind of, you know, looking at our own belly buttons and when are we actually doing, um, you know, the kind of work I think that comes from the close looking that Jennifer was doing with the, with the map collection? Where's the, you know, where's the balance there? This is just a sort of an aside from what you're saying, but um, I think that all of our um, talks were, revealed really how seeing and looking very closely at something can tell you a lot more about it than just a superficial look or a photograph. And that this, uh, I think, resonates with the earlier talks to this morning about really needing to see the object and being able to handle it. It's one of the great things about the New Art Museum is that you can actually take these things into study rooms and see them. Also at the Peabody, we have uh, classrooms for that purpose and um, I think that, uh, you know, with all the new technology that we have at our disposal, that um, seeing with the naked eye is still really important, but not just that, but being able to um, copy things, as Stephen was saying. He knows that um, painting probably better than many people because he had to copy it. And um, those plaster casts were useful for that purpose um, because students and other people who drew from them, and that's really how we embed that memory in our brains. Um, so having people draw things, um, I think, is really important, and having the objects available for that as well. Well, uh, Lynette's question also raises, I think, a point that is uh, a feature that is shared among all the talks, which is that uh, in each of the objects you discuss and the fields you work in, uh, German art, American art, Mayan art, uh, the objects you deal with could end up in a number of different types of institutions. The, the fog or the bush. Uh, in American art, I think there are objects which are claimed by, uh, broadly speaking, American uh, material culture and art history. There is the Peabody the fog ethnology and art. And uh, I wanted to, this kind of raises the question of what are the kind of contingencies in these cases the, uh, that really determine uh, the, f the, the fates, the kind of institutional homes in which the objects you work with are moored? Are there, is there a way of kind of thinking about this more, more systematically uh, in some sense in the context of this panel? Mm -hmm. yeah. One thing I, I would say uh, a bit uh, back to what Lynette was, was describing is if you'd want a, an institutional critique and hire a latter-day Hans Hacke to produce a, um, a self-critical uh, Germanic art museum, you wouldn't have a better version than the actual Bush because the Bush is a sort of self-critical, constantly uh, troubled um, institution. And I think that's, in, in response to the question, there's some, I think there's some, some virtue of mismatching objects to, their collect, to the collection. Of course, it's be, be, been done now as almost a standard uh, new museological gesture is, uh, is decontextualization, bringing contemporary works of art in relationship to the past works and so forth. But I think that in, in, uh, within each collection, there are, uh, each collection is in fact completely serendipitous or uh, odd and accidental. Uh, and it just conceals that fact. Some ex uh, is one of the reasons why the, I think the more eccentric an ex a, a museum's identity is, the better, which means that that eccentricity is best preserved rather than um, uh, turned into whatever is the n current norm of museum, uh, muse museology. Whatever that current norm is, it'll erase, it'll destroy the, the plaster casts, 
uh, as curiosities. It, uh, we can't trust our own um, understanding of what the future museum will be, but I think holding on to eccentricity is a very, very good thing to do. I would say that I think um, a lot of what we imagine is serendipitous, is, is, actually, is something that, an experience that's generated out of um, crossing the taxonomical boundaries around objects. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I accidentally found that little scratched face on this map, but I wouldn't have found it, I think, if I hadn't gone into the map collection and decided that I wanted to look at these sheets as if I were looking at a fine print, you know, and really thinking about um, the scale and nature of, of, of the inscriptions and then the incisions on the plate. Um, and, and so I, I would say that, you know, however eccentric the, the original taxonomic boundaries that we put around these objects, um, they'll, be, they, they'll be endlessly productive if we're willing to, to break them at, you know, in, in, a, in particular kinds of ways. So, so I've been thinking a lot about this notion of serendipity and chance in the collections, and I, I think in some ways it's an effect of the, of the taxonomies that have been um, bequeathed to us historiographically. I, just said, I mean, to this question of why, where, why things are where they are now, I think another thing that has been interesting as we try and track the movement of different objects around campus is that it's, like, it's this circulation that happens outside the market, right? Things aren't sold from one collection to the other, but it has everything to do with critical fortune, too, so that the Copleys are banished from the uh, Fog Museum when American painting is kind of banished from Harvard, and uh, that... Um, decision plays out uh, across every different part of this small collection that we're looking at where uh, the privileged object of the time gets saved and preserved and brought up to the privileged institution of the time. M for much of the history I'm looking at, it's the library. And everything else gets banished to these other uh, corner collections. And some of that tide seems to follow market or fashion patterns too, as much as we'd like to be insulated from all that. I'd like you to join me in thanking our panelists today. Thank you. Thank you.